software developer at DX5. And uh, I'm honored to be standing here in front of you. And um, yeah, so um, I'm going to take to, to be the lead in this in today's discussion. And uh, the topic of the discussion is uh, digital manufacturing uh, towards industry 5.0. Is the future already here? This is pretty some heady stuff. And uh, I hope you're strapped in and ready to enjoy the session. Uh, with me are uh, our four panelists. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce them. We have uh, Ken Oguang, uh, who is the head of digital and technology, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa at Diageo. And we have uh, Professor Kamal <coughs> Gashigi, who is the executive director, uh, Gearbox. And we have uh, Flora Kenuthia, who is the CIO, Farmer's Choice. And last but not least, we have Edgar Okioga, who is the area head, digital business solutions, West and Central Africa uh, at BAT. Thanks for joining us, guys. And uh, we hope, uh, thanks for joining us, guys. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll uh, <coughs> give us uh, an awesome session as we move ahead. So um, I'm going to uh, give a, a brief outline of what uh, th the stages we've gone through uh, in industrialization from industry 1.0 to uh, uh, industry 4.0. That's where we are currently, as the general consensus says. Uh, and uh, the hope of doing this is to lay a foundation for uh, the crux of this discussion, which is Industry 5.0. Industry 1.0 was characterized by the use of water and steam to power production tools. And uh, uh, during this time, we see man moving from uh, using his hands mostly to trying to find a way to make his work easier. And uh, next up is Industry 2.0, where we saw um, uh, the uh, uh, railroads coming up and telegraphs, which made it possible for human beings and information to be uh, transported or transmitted over long distances. Uh, during this stage, we also saw um, the, <coughs> the advent of electricity. Uh, Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, I see Edgar, I see Flora and uh, uh, Ken. Um, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Kamar will join us later. Um, okay guys, uh, thank you for, for joining us in this session. And uh, it's great to, 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 to see you all here. Um, Edgar, I know you are, you're not in the country, you're two hours uh, behind. Uh, is it okay you tell us where you are or uh, uh, if it's okay for you to safely disclose your location? <laughs> uh, that would be lovely. Sure. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the silicon. Uh, read silicon, is it silicon savanna? Is it a silicon Africa? That's in Lagos, Nigeria. Happy to be here uh, from BAT. Uh, thank you for again hosting me. And, uh, and, and it's really, I mean, the heart of where innovation is happening. I mean, the heart of where uh, the fifth industrial revolution is occurring day by day. And I'm seeing it unfold in the, in, at the speed that is really remarkable and worth talking about. And I'm happy to be here to actually share my thoughts on the thing. Thanks, Edgar. Um, we're happy to have you here. Um, before we, we, we continue uh, with the session, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, just uh, welcome our viewers and uh, uh, 
you awesome panelists to to the show and um uh, okay um so uh back to to where we were um I was giving a brief history of industrialization and um, trying to build momentum towards uh, the, 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 the main topic of discussion today, which is Industry 5.0. And I was uh, um, just giving the, the, the developments that uh, mankind has gone through uh, leading to um, Industry 4.0. And... Um, In the previous discussions that uh, you've all uh, uh, witnessed, we've seen um, a lot of discussion uh, going on about Industry 5.0, uh, Industry 4.0 rather, about uh, automation in industries, um, the benefits uh, that automation has brought about, and um, um, basically rev uh, revolving around uh, um, efficiency and productivity and quality of production and all that you know and currently this is where we are most companies who ventured into this area of industrialization um this is where we are but why are we talking about industry 5.0 uh, i see professor kamau has joined us welcome professor thank you uh, it's nice to have you. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> so, um, thank you all. And um, I hope we'll put our heads and hearts together and uh, give our viewers a session worth remembering. So, um, You're all top experts in your various, in, in, in your respective fields. And um, I'm sure you are in, uh, you have a first-hand experience with um, uh, automation in your industries, with uh, um, uh, machines that make work easier in your, in your industries. But before this, uh, I'm sure, b before uh, uh, you guys brought in automation into your industries, I'm sure uh, things weren't uh, going on as expected in terms of profitability and all that. Uh, can you briefly explain to us maybe the challenges that uh, your companies faced before the introduction of smart technology? Uh, I'd like to start with you, Flora. Maybe just briefly tell us uh, the challenges that uh, Farmer's Choice faced before bringing in uh, automation. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Flora Chino here. I am the CIO at Farmer's Choice, and uh, Farmer's Choice is a leading manufacturer of uh, fresh products. Uh, we talk across uh, things like our packaging, bacon, continental, and uh, fresh cuts. We, uh, uh, we actually service uh, the local market and as well as export market. Now, uh, talking about uh, Industry 4.0, I was here a while ago uh, and the by duty was uh, actually putting up a system that was uh, rotating around financial where the most important thing was uh, to provide the financial report on time, ensuring that uh, we pass the journals and uh, the financial position of the company is uh, achieved and, and on time. Now, what I think is that uh, journals will be passed and the uh, production was not part of uh, the system, the same ERP that you're running right now. And uh, what I meant is that the data will be captured from various angles manually or uh, otherwise on spreadsheets, and uh, later on it will be entered into the ERP system. Uh, this was extremely hard for traceability, which was also very key at the time, and they were key today. 
Uh, we experienced a very strenuous exchange of data, which are, as I said, some of which will be manual and others will be uh, exact. Now, given that uh, this data is being transferred from uh, production uh, personnel and a finance person, uh, sometimes the finance person will feel more urgent and they are keeping the data into the system. And uh, where the production person gets sent, they will do the same, having repetition and a lot of cleaning up of data. Uh, that is what actually kept uh, the IT team on, uh, on their toes, trying to clean up the data, verifying and ensuring that there's not, that not double entry. We also had uh, a lot of uh, data verification, which involved uh, the Department of IT internal audit and posting, to ensure that even what you're giving out as management report is uh, aligned and uh, is uh, giving a proper financial position, giving a uh, data production. And uh, for your information, then you couldn't afford uh, to give data production because the, 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 the data to be keeping was massive and uh, it is being done after the production process is done. This affected, of course, uh, visibility of, uh, of the operations in the factory, visibility of, uh, of, uh, of the position of all warehouses. Uh, and when I say about warehouses, we talk about the working progress and uh, the finished goods warehouses. That uh, automatically affects the way we sell it to the customer. Not very sure of the products are that whether they are available or not. And uh, the customer satisfaction was quite, was quite uh, questionable, delayed, and the process uh, was um, running throughout uh, the day and the night. And uh, these, among other things, uh, were things that affected uh, the operations in uh, in, uh, in IT and uh, in, the, in the organization. Until when things changed and uh, we started seeing the demand from uh, costing, where they needed to know the cost of production as and it happened. And that uh, did change the, 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 the event and we started looking at uh, the kinds of things that we are doing in our system. Uh, allow me to stop there. Uh, those are the main. Uh, uh, the advantages of the, the, the issue that we faced before the fall of the Thanks, Flora. Um, you've touched on uh, a lot of things which um, characterize uh, um, so many problems that were faced uh, prior to the introduction of smart uh, uh, automation in industries. And um, um, uh, on to you, Ken. Um, uh, can you briefly describe the kind of I IoT setup uh, that you have at uh, EABL? Uh, just briefly. Thanks, Victor, and I hope you can hear me. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, I think within EABL, in terms of the uh, IoT and industrial IoT, we'll probably look into areas. One within the factory premises itself, and then uh, the other, of course, as well in the field, especially with our coolers, uh, where we've also embedded IoT. So within within the premises, uh, we have sensors embedded almost everywhere. Um, one of the things that uh, it helps us drive is quality. And in, in terms of quality, it measures things, uh, I think, in the previous video that I mentioned, uh, like the temperature uh, at which you're, you're actually brewing at. Uh, it also controls um, the entire brewing process in a way. For example, in the past, uh, if you're done with fermentation, um, and that's one process in brewing, and you want to go, for example, uh, into filtration, we used to have connections before, and you would uh, manually open some of those uh, valves to move uh, the product uh, from uh, fermentation either to the uh, to the uh, to or maybe from the brewing tap to fermentation, or fermentation to cooling, and then to filtration. So you used to have that done manually. Now, if you have sensors embedded almost in, on each of, each of those uh, devices, then behind your computer, it's just a click of a button to say, I'm done with the fermentation. Uh, let's now move into uh, filtration or cooling. And then uh, the valves automatically open up and, and that, that goes through. So uh, that helps as well uh, in, the, in the brain process. Uh, when it comes to uh, now bottling itself, and that's where we also do a lot of uh, uh, sensors and uh, IoT, 
uh, and they check all kinds of things. Uh, they check uh, the overfills, uh, for example, you don't want to get a product, a beer, that uh, is all the way up to the neck. I know uh, you probably feel happy that you've gotten an extra uh, content, an extra alcohol for you to take, but it affects many other things, including the carbon dioxide that is inside there that makes it as palatable as it is. Or you don't want to get, get a beer that is uh, a quarter way filled up. Uh, you don't want to get a beer that uh, has impurities in there. Uh, you, you're looking at this, you find there's something in there. No. So the filters that actually are put into factory process that enables uh, those checks and controls uh, to eliminate that before it gets into the factory floor. And it goes and does that at such a fast level uh, that uh, any human being possibly cannot cannot manage. So that's in the factory floor, we, we have quite a bit of that. And, and in the field, like I said, yes, for the coolers that we have, uh, and I earlier on I had you now talking about the sense, so it tracks the location where your coolers are. It, in case uh, there's a uh, movement of the cooler, it sends an alert. It attracts, uh, it, it uh, tracks things like uh, the openings of the cooler that gives an idea of uh, how, how frequently that cooler is being used. And there's some coolers that we have actually withdrawn from the field based on the reports that have come out uh, from, from those sensors and IoT, because it tells me that uh, you've opened your fridge once in five days, and that means your outlet is not selling as per optimal. And depending on the size of cooler you have, you can probably just remove it and give it to somebody who actually needs it. Yeah? Or a cooler that has been taken away from the site without us being notified. Um, and, and those coolers belong to us. Uh, so we, we follow that report uh, to build security make sure we find out where the schoolers are and retrieve it. So it's, it's, it's used quite, quite a lot. And uh, going forward, I can only see it increasing. Uh, that's fascinating, uh, Ken. And um, so basically we all agree that uh, automation or smart technology, I IoT in this case, uh, has, um, has a lot of advantages in uh, production processes. You know, boosting efficiency and productivity, uh, the end goal being uh, profitability for the entire business. And um, as much as machines or uh, you know, just the, the whole uh, automation thing goes, um, as much as it has uh, made companies who've adopted uh, this strategy profitable you know, and leaders in their respective niches, um, I tend to think the human element, or the human factor rather, plays a critical role in uh, production processes. Uh, allow me to ask this question. This question goes to Edgar. Uh, yeah. Are there any concerns that uh, the use of machines, or, or let's say just automation in general, um, has had in, in your industry, or, or let's say just uh, uh, in your opinion, in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you for a good question, Victor. This first something I want to just uh, share with you. You mentioned that um, sensor information help us uh, deliver more profits. It's true, but there's also one other thing that's really pivotal uh, to BAT. It's about health and safety of our employees. Mm -hmm. Sensors help us determine how someone is close to a dangerous piece of equipment, optimal working environment. That's really, really important, our people first. And uh, there are wearables these days that actually can help uh, um, uh, people know that they're in a dangerous situation or they should take a lot. But over to your question. In terms of uh, uh, um, where machines and technology that are disadvantageous, I would say over-reliance on technology removes the human element of decision-making, of innovation, mm -hmm. of creativity. Those are aspects that we cannot depend on machines. And, and here at BAT, we're very clear about one thing. We drive 100% employee engagement when it comes to all matters manufacturing. And secondly, we drive for a zero-loss mindset. These two aspects actually drive the entire ethos and culture in manufacturing. If I look at 100% employee engagement, it's about harnessing technology in a way that empowers the person to be more. 
Creativity innovation is a human aspect that can grow and it grows with empowerment. Depending wholly on technology for creativity, that, that dehumanizes me as a person. When it comes to zero loss mindset, it's about looking at the end-to-end -end processes. Ken and Flora have spoken about how automation and sensors remove losses from the system. When we look at the entire process of zero loss mindset, it begs the question, when I switch on the light, yet I can see, what loss am I carrying there? When I'm transporting this product in a, in a container that's not fully packed, what losses am I carrying? What scope one, scope two, scope three carbon footprint can I reduce today by being more efficient, effective? So these two elements are really critical and they cannot depend on the machine. The human being must be there. So when I look at, uh, at, at the question of uh, machines and, and what disadvantages they have, so to speak, over-reliance and placing the human being behind the machine is not appropriate. Then second is a circular economy. Um, we're in an era where our consumers are very, very aware of the impact on the environment. And this is not something machine can do or technology. It is still back up to the human being. We need to think about the entire value chain of our consumer's experience and our product. And at the very end of the day, look at how we get the products that we produce to be secondary products to others. And, and there's a whole conversation about this occurring throughout the world on how one can recycle. Again, technology doesn't do it for us. It is us, the human being. So um, uh, when I look at it, it's about using technology, the 4.0 technology, to help us become more productive from a functional point of view. But when it comes to the social impact, the emotional impact, we still need to focus on the human being. The worker, the employee, society comes first. Thank you, Victor. That's a great point you raise, uh, Edgar. Uh, the social impact, the social element in all this. Which brings me to the crux of our discussion, um, <coughs> uh, Industry 5.0. Industry 5.0 is seen as uh, a reaction to the impact that Industry 4.0 uh, has had so far in terms of sidelining human beings. We focus so much on uh, 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 using machines to boost our productivity and efficiency in, uh, in our various industries and uh, trying to minimize the human element as much as possible because, hey, human beings make errors, right? Machines don't. But machines make errors too. <coughs> it can be an error in programming. Um, which brings me to um, a question I'd like to ask uh, Professor Kamau. Uh, Professor Kamau, you, uh, you, you, you work for Gearbox. Gearbox is, uh, is a company that uh, um, provides the tools for innovators to, 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 to build different kinds of machines. You are an, uh, an enabler in this respect, rather. So um, I'd like to ask you, a question that revolves around uh, uh, what 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 made you come uh, into this space? What made you decide to uh, provide the tools and uh, just the infrastructure that people need to build uh, machines for various applications? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's a very important one. And thanks also for promoting me and making me a professor. I'm sure a lot of my colleagues are smiling. But uh, uh, I think the answer, the answer to your question is, um, through my career, I began uh, after my uh, doctorate. I worked in Japan for three years, came back to Kenya, and began teaching uh, at the University of Nairobi, and was very quickly very impressed and uh, excited by the talent. A lot of students who were really, really good at engineering, and also faculty members who understood uh, their stuff, but uh, the trouble was that the ecosystem wasn't really enabling. Uh, there wasn't the equipment that you'd expect. Uh, changing curriculum and, and, and modernizing it is very, very difficult because of bureaucracy. And so um, we, we enjoyed what happened with Safaricom. Uh, mobile money comes on the scene, and you start seeing all the kind of fintech ideas, uh, giving people new businesses, startups, and so on. And so we asked ourselves, how can this kind of uh, 
um, uh, environment that's growing be benefit people who are engineers who make things that people use. Uh, and you know, it, the digital um, you know revolution is with us for sure. But you cannot wish away materiality. Uh, things you still need things. And so we felt very strongly that any economy. Uh, needs to be able to supply a good percentage of what it consumes and what needs to be put into place within our country, Kenya, and more broadly, Africa, to make this happen. Because you have a set of people, engineers, who are trained to make this happen, but the ecosystem is such that they can't be absorbed. So per capita output or the per capita um, um, sort of number of engineers in Kenya is way below par if you compare with some of the benchmark nations like Malaysia, Vietnam, and so on. And yet those uh, few that we have, are not being sufficiently absorbed. Many of them end up going into auditing, banking, or other kinds of industries. Abortion of purpose, you know. So if you're a CS industrialization education, you may be wondering, when we spend all this money training engineers, <clears throat> and then we end up the engineering solutions we have, we're importing from outside. Is that really what we want to be doing? So that's where the genesis of Gearbox comes from. And um, so we have, uh, just as you, uh, all the other participants have, have given uh, very constructive examples of how uh, for fourth industrial revolution is is working in Kenya. Um, uh, what our de- uh, sort of desire is to be able to present solutions to A E A B L B A T Farmers Choice and the others uh, in Kenya that are made and designed by Kenyans. Now the capacity to make those solutions is there for sure. We in, in Gearbox we have a lot of engineers that design CNC machines, computer numerical control, mm-hmm. and so that's where the computer uh, drives the, com- the, the the machine to machine something and and produce a product. It could be um, you know plasma cutting, it could be wood carving, and you're having the numerical control of the tool being done by a computer rather than a person. And so we were making those machines. Those are third industrial revolution. When you now integrate such machines with um, IoT, industrial uh, in, uh, internet of things that we've been talking about already, and so that you have systems that are integrated whereby you don't need human intervention, then now that's fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the fifth industrial revolution aspect that you just mentioned, I think it's important, although I don't think it merits the title fifth industrial revolution, I think it's just a step within the fourth, but that's uh, beside the point. But I think that um, what, one of the challenges that we have in terms of the question you asked, why did we set Gearbox up, is if I have a system, let's say a system like SCADA, or um, uh, you know some system from a company like Festo. These are huge companies that create automation systems that are employed by our big manufacturers in Kenya. And uh, these are very expensive. Something goes wrong, you have to refer back to the guys in, in Germany or wherever they are, and that's expensive. An expert may have to come out and what have you. Uh, they're very often uh, a young engineer can create a substitute for that kind of a process that can be used in a, in a setting such as uh, one of these big companies. And uh, it can be demonstrated to work. And we've done that, like, for example, with a, ba- a bakery where they were making bread, bread in one of our towns. And they had an automated system. And it broke down. It was from Germany. I won't mention the brand. Uh, but we were able to replace it. But the question now becomes, the engineer who makes the decision to get a local supplier, what if something goes wrong? If something goes wrong with a Siemens system, you have legal recourse and so on. But if some young Kenyan has designed something and it goes wrong and now production is, is at risk uh, you know, because it's, it's not working, I think there's a lot of uh, hesitancy in the decision maker within the corporate uh, structure to take on a local solution because of such things. So we need to have an ecosystem that works. We need to have government policy. We need to have maybe some kind of insurance policies or some way to say if something goes wrong with a local innovation, the company will be supported to cover that loss or something so that we can grow our own uh, Siemens and and other kinds of systems uh, that are local and we can export to the region. So that's the kind of space we are working in. And it's quite exciting. And I really liked what uh, Edgar shared regarding the fact that it doesn't matter whether you're in the 17th Industrial Revolution, you cannot replace ingenuity of the human being. We recently had uh, Charlie Mwangi, who is an engineer that I'm sure a lot of the people listening and the other panelists may be aware. He worked at Tesla and then Rivian. So he's had top jobs within the engineering world. Uh, he was, you know, reporting to Elon Musk directly. And he spoke to us the other day. He was here at Gearbox. He gave a talk, which we'll have online soon. And he was telling us how they, they look at the physics, the basic physics of a problem uh, before designing a system. So if you're making a car, and a car body comprises many different parts, the question they begin by asking is, how can you make, uh, what is the minimum number of parts that the car can be made from? It's clearly one. 
So he said, okay, how do we move toward making just one a monocoque, one body, one body from one part? And uh, they ended up casting the body. Uh, and that meant that they, they were able to uh, remove a lot of robots and so on and leapfrog over what, uh, you know, very old um, and established companies like Toyota and BMW and what have you have been doing uh, and, and, you know, reduce costs tremendously because of the approach to innovation. So I think you can never underestimate the value of that kind of approach to engineering. So we as Gearbox want to make that more possible for our local engineers to use design thinking and some basic physics types of approaches to solution uh, creation of solutions and then presenting those to the local uh, marketplace and i know I'm, I'm probably over my time but i'll just say quickly the local marketplace isn't just the private sector we are very big on insisting that the public sector which is the biggest consumer in any economy gives business to its own people as a matter of policy and even legal by law otherwise we'll never be able to do what the likes of vietnam and uh, malaysia and and uh, korea and japan before them uh, have done thank you okay thank mm. you that was enlightening uh, professor um we're talking about industry 5.0 where the human factor is uh, being brought back in the mix, so to speak. And uh, the main concerns of Industry 5.0 are uh, human-centeredness and su uh, sustainability. So um, this question goes to Flora. Uh, in your industry or in your company, to be more specific, uh, are there any measures you've put in place to sort of like put focus back on human beings in manufacturing? Thank you very much, Victor. Um, and uh, Professor Kamau, yes, uh, we will need your services and I will get back to you as soon as we finish this. Yes, uh, I, I just analyzed uh, our situation in the past. Our situation at the present uh, means that uh, we have uh, done quite a lot of uh, automation. I would say we are in a position where we can say we are smart uh, manufacturing. But I'll tell you this uh, day I walked into a meeting and I said I want to do uh, some robotics uh, system in the factory. And everybody was like, hang on, you, 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 you've lost us. Uh, we, we, can't, we are not ready for robots in this country. Uh, but what I meant is that uh, we need to really uh, point out uh, the stations and the points uh, where we're doing transactions and how to meet them with very easy and uh, very usable uh, technology, uh, mobile devices and uh, certain uh, technology that uh, we can uh, work with uh, and the ones that you use on a daily basis. Now, uh, when you look at the systems that we set up, sometimes it is uh, more or less IT systems or expert systems. Now, the cut here between uh, Industry 4.0 and 5.0 is integrating the human into these uh, systems that you're building. It is very crucial for us, to, uh, for us human to be a smart human. And uh, ideally, when I say smart human, it's not what you have learned in school, how the, 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 uh, the expertise that you have in the production, but it is the smartness of using the tools that are being uh, presented to you to effectively and efficiently produce in a manner that uh, is going to, to give the company a, a good turnaround. So uh, when we align uh, the human with the system, and definitely, we are bound to get uh, more efficient. When we talk of uh, smart systems, smart operations, or uh, smart goals, then uh, here we have to talk about human as well. Uh, many times we feel we leave the, 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 the people behind. Uh, we have software, we have hardware. It is uh, time now we have uh, lifeware, we have humanware. Uh, that integrate with the systems that you're developing, the systems that are introducing in the company. That is where we are at Formal Choice, where we have uh, quite a, a huge automation. Uh, we have uh, dashboards that uh, our end users are supposed to use to get a single uh, uh, value chain uh, view of all the processes and batches, stores, inventories, and uh, anything that is happening. 
But uh, if you do not uh, up their game, you don't take them through, you don't train them, you don't uh, enhance them uh, to the level in which these systems are supposed to be given, then you are actually creating a gap between the systems and the humans, and you're not going to realize the, 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 the production or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, an interactive uh, system, uh, today, if you, if you may, uh, many people want to communicate on insta, instant uh, communication like uh, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, and uh, such. Similarly, you want a real-time operation, and you want alerts that are going to various uh, uh, heads of departments or uh, various people who are doing manufacturing. How do you do that if you're not alerting them or, or getting them aware of what you're putting in place? So much as we deal with uh, fresh products. We buy uh, animals from various far farmers. We process those animals and uh, they become products that we are selling. Now for us, uh, quality is key and uh, traceability is key. And uh, we have to be able to see, to have a visibility what is happening from the point the animals were delivered, they were slaughtered, they were butchered, processed, and uh, they, were, they, they are sold. Now for us to be able to do that, every person who is handling, that, who is handling uh, uh, the, pro the process has to be well aware of the systems that we have developed. Like I said when I started, we went around uh, a system that was a financial system Today, I'll say that uh, we are dealing with a system that is all-rounded, a system that is able to give uh, quality, give uh, feasibility. But most importantly, and where we're headed to, is to ensure that that system is quite interactive with the human. Uh, we have uh, remote workers. Like uh, when I'm seated here, I actually see what is going on in the factory, and I can be able to change a few things here and there. However, I need to get uh, that marrying with a person who is on site, uh, who is able to, who can be able to actually uh, fine tune whatever is going on and uh, and get things going. We cannot leave everything to system. We cannot leave everything to a program. Mm -hmm. We have to have a human brain uh, that is actually interacting with the system and uh, fine tuning the system to do what is expected. We are the developers of the goals. We are the developers of the of the of the productivity that you want to give the the, the organization. And therefore, we must drag the system to be able to give us the goals, the smart goals that we are looking forward to, the smart operations that we are looking forward to, and you, you must be able to realize all the things that you have put in place uh, uh, as humans and interpret that. Digitally, I think that is where we are headed to as a, as a, as a, as a, as a people. That uh, systems are not replacing people. Systems are working with people. Systems are integrating with people because we have experts in various areas. And when we say actually systems are are, are replacing people, we are already being misleading because uh, the system developers are not experts. They need to be guided by people who are experts in various uh, fields. So uh, uh, in Anasia, what I'll say is that uh, we look for responsive and, uh, and uh, distributive uh, supply chain uh, systems that are interacting with human beings and that are really uh, uh, realizing what uh, human beings want. The next step should be Focusing on our people. When you tell them that you're building up a robotic system, then they really much understand what you're talking about and where you're coming from and where you're going to. Otherwise, we'll be left with uh, systems that are not used by the end user simply because they do not understand them. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. But I would like to interject a point, uh, please, if I may, very briefly. 
I, I think that there is definitely right. replacement of people happening. There's no doubt about it. If you have a tea, tea, tea plantation where they bring a, a harvester mm -hmm. that is mechanized, you, a lot of people lose their jobs. If I look at generative design, uh, CAD software right right now, you can use uh, AI to actually design, like, let's say, any kind of a part. Let's say, let's say a, um, a rim for a, for, a, for a car tire, mm -hmm. the rim. And it will generate, a, 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 the, the computer will generate the full design without uh, an engineer who's, you know, very qualified qualified being necessary. If I look at what happened in Tesla, what I was explaining, when they put in all these uh, robots, when I visited the factory, uh, I went to see it in California, there were like four people uh, on the whole factory floor, that's all, and uh, the machines were doing everything else. So there isn't a doubt that people will be replaced, but I think the business will increase, new kinds of jobs will be created, and that's where you'll find people being replaced, uh, or rather being finding different kinds of work you know so retraining is very important and so on uh, and ultimately there are uh, some scenarios that are being painted where people now will be getting universal basic income whereby you know uh, people are paid just to, to to be alive because the the industrial system is earning enough money to afford it and that's what the world economic forum is pushing so i, I think the fifth industrial revolution there's some reality yes uh, and everything Fl flora said is correct flora said is correct because you're know, saying the system will still have somebody but when it's really really done efficiently and you're trying to save money there'll be much fewer people than than before i think that's a, a fact um i think just to add that. there is is uh it's to be related to say that people will have a different purpose that machine operator will not longer be a machine operator that machine operator will be a data scientist if they have the mindset to reinvent themselves because the fifth and the fourth industrial revolution come up with some learning, core learning requirements. And Dr. has mentioned on design thinking. Uh, there's agile. There is storytelling. Very, very powerful. Um, there is data science I've just mentioned. So these are new capabilities that are brought such that the people who are now moved away from that initial work can have new opportunities. So it has a silver lining. I see, I see you are all passionate about this topic of uh, machines sort of like um, um, replacing human beings, you know, and uh, the whole problems uh, that arise from it, unemployment and all that. Um, coming back to you, to, to, to what you've talked about, Professor, you mentioned you went to, you visited Tesla, the company. Uh, when was this? I would have been 20, I think 2018, there about 2019. Uh, I remember there was a tweet by Elon Musk, uh, if not 2018, then 2019, uh, where he said uh, he realizes there is a problem of excessive automation in at, at Tesla. And uh, uh, after that statement, he said human beings are, are actually important. They're like a vital factor to production processes, which um, I, I agree with personally. Uh, I don't know what, uh, what uh, uh, Ken, uh, you have to say about that. Do you think uh, human beings are an important factor in production or machines can you know, just continue doing what they do? Thanks, Victor. And, and, and I think uh, my colleagues touched on it um, earlier when we talked about the things that you cannot replace with machines, uh, the innovation, that creative mind, the ingenuity. But to answer you, I can I, let me just borrow a story around my friend. You know, he wanted to get into farming. So what then he did was uh, uh, he said, you know what, uh, I'm going to implement technology. And he went full scale technology. Uh, so uh, he put in uh, uh, sprinklers, towns for sunken boreholes for irrigation. Uh, he very mechanized farming on a very large scale. Uh, generators to power all the works. Two years down the road, he was out. Uh, it wasn't successful. And I think uh, when you want to automate or you want to bring in technology, you need to ask yourself, what you're doing that for, what is your purpose? If you want to digitize or digitalize, or you want to bring in mechanization, it has to be driven by something. First, it has to be the end game in terms of the consumers. What do the consumers want? 
Are you driving cost efficiency? Are you, do you want to increase the scale to meet the consumer demand, increase consumer demand? Or are you just copying because uh, Tesla is, 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 is going robotic, so you think it's a good idea and you're going to do it? I believe in something called appropriate technology for, for your industry and for your organization, which means that you analyze what is available out there. And then you determine and you decide what then needs to come into play. What do you need to uh, implement? Yeah. Without that, then uh, you will not be doing anything uh, that is uh, founded on science. It is mostly wit. So human beings will always be there and they are needed because they provide an additional advantage that machines do not have. However, I see automation increasing, especially things that are manual. It, uh, it makes a lot of sense for you to automate that. Uh, in some instances, I see it being complementary. Uh, for example, we've just gone through elections. We, we saw what happened with the IABC. So you have technology in place, but there is a manual process that complements that. Where either driven by compliance, uh, you require something to be done uh, by a human being or to be verified by a human being for it to be deemed to be true, then that will still remain. But increasingly and going forward, we'll have a lot of automation happening. And that's, that's, the, that's the direction. The human beings will evolve because we are never stagnant. We'll evolve, adapt new skills, and use them uh, in, in whatever capacities that will be required of us. So many years ago, we didn't have AI. We didn't have uh, things like ML. We're not talking about that. Data as it is right now and the demand for data and for you to break it down and analyze and come up with the proper insights for the business, we didn't have that before. But those are now the new skill sets that are people looking at. The other day, I was trying to see the top paid professionals in the world. And a lot of them are, are based on some of these new capabilities that are coming up. So we'll evolve as human beings. Uh, uh, the new generation will have different things. Their priorities may actually be different, yeah. but uh, technology itself will continue growing. There's nothing that's gonna stop it. It will continue growing because of the clamor to ensure that things get simplified, things get faster, things get more efficient. How that applies to you, it will be you to determine. Ken, it's very insightful and very deep. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, and uh, it brings me to um, a closing remark. Um, many companies still um, see Industry 4.0 as the next big thing. They haven't transitioned themselves to Industry 5.0 considerations. And um, we don't know when uh, they're going to do that. But uh, I'd like to sort of like go around the table, just a yes or no answer to this final question before we wind up our discussion. Uh, it's based on the topic of our discussion uh, towards Industry 5.0. Are we already there? Just yes or no, Professor, are we already there? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Professor, you, we can't hear you. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the answer is no, because I don't believe there's an industry 5.0, but that's another <laughs> matter. We could discuss that later. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, how about you, Flora? Yes, I also go with the no. I don't think uh, we have reached a point where we are able to marry the systems and the human beings. And uh, we are far from uh, autopilot, and I don't even think we'll ever get to autopilot. Uh, we will always need human, but we need to up the game for the human. So no, we haven't gotten there. Okay. How about you, Edgar? And uh, no. <laughs> and you can. <laughs> I would, I, would say, I would say it's a journey, uh, so it's ongoing. We're not yet there. It's ongoing. And just quickly say, there's a lot of focus internally on what human beings are, but there's the aspect of ESG that we continue to talk about, environment, society, and governance, sustainability. That also is what society expects of you. It's also, in a way, part of Industry 5.0.
and that is driving a lot of actions within businesses today. We're not yet there, but on a journey. Thank you, guys. Um, you've given us a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I hope we are going to have this maybe sometime in the future because I feel like I haven't uh, asked you uh, everything I wanted to ask you because of, of, of the timing. And to our viewers, I hope you've enjoyed the session. I hope you've uh, gotten uh, something out of this, something that will uh, probably benefit you uh, in your business uh, or uh, just uh, whatever you do uh, from day to day. So thank you for joining us, guys. Um, bye. Thank you.